Hi everyone, it's me, Becky. Um, back with another video for you that is pretty much me. And this is something that I've been wanting to talk about for a while. It's just, you know, really hard to talk about something that has been, you know, quite painful. This is my, uh, the story of my coming out. Growing up my entire life, I grew up in a very uh, Christian household. You know, both parents went to church, my sisters, me. We, we went every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, and every Wednesday night. And sometimes there were even, even like um, week-long revivals. And I have family down in Georgia. We'd go down there and my great uncle's a preacher, so we'd listen to him preach and stuff. And uh, I grew up with a strong connection to God. And also along with that came my, um, a, a little bit closed mindedness. I mean, I know what it says in the Bible, but that's what I'm going to talk to you about how hard I struggled to not be something that I was supposed to grow up disagreeing with. And I will say that I was homophobic I never used gay slurs towards people. I never said it to their face. I never, you know, acted any certain like terrible way towards them, but it would just run all over me like, oh, you're gay, don't, don't get near me, you're weirding me out. And I, I, I grew up with crushes on females and I didn't actually, absorb it as a crush on a female you know my kinder it, it was as far back as like um my kindergarten teacher it's a friend that i made in kindergarten and one of my friends in third grade and you know up until fourth grade i was in public school and whenever i went into a uh, private christian school I tried even harder to date boys and stuff. I mean, that didn't really happen because, you know, I wasn't the type that the boys at my school wanted, but I strived for boys' attention. Like, I had a bunch of guys who were friends, and I just felt, you know, like I belonged. I did have a crush on this boy named Sean. It's ironic because that's the name of my nephew that passed away, but I, ha I had had that crush on him. Granted, you know, he had feminine features and, you know, blonde hair and blue eyes and, you know, that's just what I was attracted to, I guess. I never actually told him, but I'm really glad I didn't because, you know, in reality, I was constantly thinking about girls. And at the age of seven, actually probably almost eight, I uh, watched Titanic for the first time and saw Kate Winslet. And everyone knows, you know, she's my favorite actress. I guess I could consider her my first celebrity crush, actually. I know I did have a crush on Nick Carter. Yeah, Nick Carter. And all the Hanson brothers. But I mean, let's get real, all the Hanson brothers looked like girls anyway. So I, I stayed on this, you know, straight and narrow path. I went through my little emo phase, you know, about 13 to around the time I actually graduated high school, maybe a little bit even after. Once I quit Christian school, cause I had changed Christian, two different Christian schools. Once I changed from the Baptist school to the Pentecostal, and I was only there for four years, and then I ended up um, going to my high school, which was a public school. The thing about that is it was already junior year. I was being threatened to uh, put back, be put back into sophomore year if my grades dipped too much but I kept my grades up and I was able to stay in my junior year. Going there, the only friends I'd actually had was my cousin and her boyfriend who was a uh, quarterback on the football, he was the quarterback on the football team. And I was really quiet and shy and I didn't really have any friends, you know. So I would just go to my first 
my first uh, period and talked to the English teacher, which was Mr. Cook, and he was really cool. And he was maybe, I don't know, six, seven years older than, you know, I was. And he was just a cool guy. And finally, um, about October in gym class, I had to take gym course because I was supposed to do that like sophomore, uh, freshman and sophomore year. And so I got shoved in with a bunch of the sophomores and freshmen. And I was eating lunch alone by myself one day. Then out of nowhere, <clears throat> two girls sit down in front of me and they introduce themselves and it's, you know, Brooke and um, Samantha. I didn't expect to make, you know, really good friends with them. It just, once we started going back to class, they would always tell me, you know, hey, come over here and sit with us. Come sit on the bleachers with us. So that it started to become an everyday thing. And, you know, that's how I met Eric was through Brooke. And then every morning, you know, we would all meet up in the library before the bell would ring and we'd have to go to our classes, stuff like that. I ended up failing science in the first, like, few months. And I had to go to Fall Academy which means, you know, I didn't get any of my fall break. It's just, you had to go to school with all the other failing students and learn your subject that you've been failing. And that's how I met Chad. And me and Chad moved really quick, but you know, that was mainly him. He was, I'm not, he was a great guy, but it's like, you know, he seemed like he really, really, you know, was interested in me and nobody up until that point had really been interested in me i was kind of just like you know the background quiet no one notices me type of person and i started dating chad well during that period brooke was like you know oh yeah i'm bisexual and i got weirded out i was just like oh okay that's cool let me just scoot over here a little bit i mean i honestly i felt weirded out by it i didn't know why except for the fact that i had been raised to believe that that was wrong and to stay away from it but i didn't stay away our friendship grew stronger she was like a best friend and then i started realizing that there was something more because i would get way too excited when i would see her and you know we just vibed really good together. We had a lot in common, you know. It was December, actually the day of my birthday, and I wrote her a letter and was like, you know, there's someone I like, it's actually a girl, and I actually described Brooke. And she wrote me a letter back and she's like, I don't wanna jump the gun on here, but is that girl me? And she's like, it's probably not. It's probably Carrie, you know, I know how Carrie is with you. You probably like Carrie back. It's probably not me, but I wish it would be. So I had told her, I was like, no, actually it is you. And, you know, we talked a little bit here and there. And eventually I came to the conclusion that, you know, every time that me and Chad would do anything or we would kiss. Because, you know, I'm, I'm not 100% a gold star lesbian. I've done things. And it was mostly with Chad. It just felt weird and unnatural and just completely wrong. I felt like a puzzle piece that was being shoved into the wrong shape. And that puzzle was not getting finished because that piece was not going there. And it's just like, you know, no matter how hard I tried, no matter how hard I cried, um, the things that I let him do that I wasn't comfortable with and that I would actually cry after about. Um, you know, some people could be like, oh, well, you know, that wasn't that him sort of taking advantage of you? I mean, no, it wasn't. You know, all he knew was that, you know, we were both agreeing to do it. But what he didn't know is after we would do it later on, after he was gone, I would feel really gross and disgusting and I'd cry about it and I'm just like, this isn't right, this isn't me. And on New Year's Eve of, um, no, it wasn't New Year's Eve, it was actually January 1st, 2008. 
me i mean i called him on the phone and i know it was a really crappy way to end our relationship but i told him over the phone i'm like you know i'm gay and it's not you it's just i don't want to be with a man and he took it kind of hard and it's just you know it also took a toll on the friendship that we had made too because i mean not only were we dating we were also friends after all that you know me and brooke got together and we started dating and but the thing is you know she was also kind of you know she she liked boys too and we we dated on and off for quite a long time through the rest of um my junior year into my senior year it was actually february well hold on my sister one of my sisters at the time was not accepting like she found um a love note that i wrote to brooke and she freaked out and she was like you know you're gonna swear on sean's life that you'll never talk to her again and i swore on his life and still continued to date her and you know hang around her and stuff and february 22nd of 2008 she broke up with me and i was i mean that was like one of the worst days at school like i bawled my eyes out like all day long it was freaking ridiculous i thought the entire world was ending and it wasn't little did i know that my entire world was going to come crashing into rubble within the next week because she broke up with me on february 22nd and that also happened to be the last day i ever saw sean alive because i came to my sister's house i got i always got off the bus there and he was always you know waiting for me at the door and he was so i went inside i sat on the couch i cried he crawled up in my lap he kissed me he kept asking what's wrong and i just kept crying so eventually he dragged me to back to his room and he put on a football helmet and then he gave me this big giant ball and we played in the hallway and he wanted me to throw it at him and he would try to headbutt it with his helmet and it was just this thing we did and he just made me feel t 20 million times better he took my mind off that heartache and you know that night when my mom came to pick me up we were leaving he was bawling his eyes out he did not want us to leave we were getting ready to walk out the door and he uh refused to give us kisses so i was like okay whatever i'm just gonna leave without one then without one then and he was like no so he ran to the door and gave me a goodbye kiss and gave my mom a goodbye kiss and whenever we got into the car he was in the hallway looking out the window crying and that's the last time i ever seen him because that following monday uh brooke hadn't talked to me all day and you know we were keeping our distance from each other and i was beating myself up and i'm just like you know i freaking didn't deserve her that's just what i was putting in my head i was making myself you know i guess a pity party or just putting myself down because i felt like i didn't deserve her or something and whenever i went back to my sister's house sean wasn't waiting for me he wasn't at the door he wasn't at the window he wasn't there i go inside and nobody's home i sit and wait forever it's pitch black outside at this point it's like nine o'clock at night no no one's come home nobody's called me or nothing finally someone calls and it's like you know sean's in really bad shape he's in the hospital they're flying him to uk because um he's got really bad pneumonia and they don't have the um blood transfusions because most of my family is uh o negative blood with the rh and that's what i am too and we can donate to anyone else with any other blood type but no one else can donate to us except for our own blood type it's weird he wasn't getting the blood here so they sent him up there to try to get him better and during that you know a whole week it was just a nightmare and then i ended up getting sick on wednesday and staying home and they actually showed my nephew's story on the news thursday came along and that's whenever i uh, found out that he had died we had his funeral we, we had two wakes on saturday and then sunday and then monday was the actual uh, actual like funeral and then that's whenever they took him and buried him 
and then the next day I went back to school because I just couldn't stay home and feel numb and I wasn't eating, I wasn't sleeping, like, you know, I just didn't want to live anymore and mom was like, you need to go to school. You know, I think it'd be good for you. Other people were like, no, Becky, you need to stay home. You need to recuperate, you know, but it's just like, you know, my mom and my cousin was like, you know, it might be a good idea for you to distract yourself, go to school, be with your friends. I went back to school and Brooke had heard what happened and then she ended up getting back with me. I don't know if it was just out of pity or what, but um, fast forward, we had broken up a few other times and my mom finds a note from Brooke or when I wrote to her or something and everybody was going to church that day so mom asked me to stay home and whenever everybody left she pretty much tossed it at me and was like you know is this true are you a lesbian and I didn't I couldn't lie to her I couldn't hold it back anymore and she started crying really hard and she said a lot of very painful things that I've forgiven 100% but it's something I can't forget because no child wants to hear their mother talk to them like that I'm not going to say what it was because it was just it was really bad mom and dad kicked me out of the house that night and I had nowhere else to go so my plan while I was in my room trying to gather some things of mine together my plan was to um like try to sleep in storm storm drains and ditches and like bathe in the lake and then walk to school every day because I you know didn't know what else I was gonna do and like go to gas stations and like dig through the dumpsters and stuff like I had an entire plan of what I was gonna try to do but before that that even happened my sister you know last second was like come stay with me and so I lived with her my entire, the rest of my senior year which was 2009 and it took a few months for mom and dad to come around they finally came around they went to my graduation and you know our relationship now is great you know my mom and Amberlynn they love each other they get along Amberlynn gets along with all of my family and especially my nephews like they adore her and um my dad don't really talk about it because I mean I guess he's ashamed of it I I I guess that's what it is um, and him and Amberlynn haven't really spoken like at all I love my dad to death and he tells me every chance he gets you know that he loves me and you know let him know if I ever need anything and uh, I mean he's always come through which I try my best not to ever ask my parents for anything and for the most part I don't I want to be the ones to help them now because they've helped me my whole life. And like I said, you know, my relationship with my mother now is stronger than it was back then. You know, we're, she's also, she's awesome. She's, you know, still my mom. She's protective, she's loving, she's giving. She's also, you know, like a best friend. You know, I can talk to her anytime I want. I can go over to her house, watch movies, play games it's just you know anything we're, we're close and it's just like it's kind of awkward with dad sometimes still but that's because my dad's always kind of been an awkward guy I don't know a lot of people are scared of him because he's a he's a pretty big dude not big he's like big and he he was in the army and stuff like that so and he's got two tattoos on his arm and he's just like always kind of like quiet and stern but if you get to know him he he cracks jokes and stuff so he, he's got a sense of humor that's my coming out story and I'm sorry you know I didn't really go into detail with some of the things that was said because it's painful still to think about it I don't want it coming out of my mouth I don't want it you know if my mom watches this this video I don't want that shoved back in her face because she herself has apologized for the things that she had said during that day. She was just really hurt and really scared and she didn't know what to do. And um, she still doesn't agree with it, but she just wants me to be happy. So um, that was my coming out story. And I will have more story times for you. Thank you. And I guess I'll see you next time. Bye.